All right. Hey, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Welcome to today's uh, webcast, which is touching on a fairly important subject. And I uh, hope that uh, anyone who can't make it uh, to today's live webcast is able to tune in later. This will be recorded and available for future replays. Uh, this is important information. And uh, the star of the show here today is Chris Lachance, and she's been involved with uh, safety in the tattoo and piercing arena for longer than many of us have been tattooing and uh, but it's going to have a lot to say on the subject. We're going to talk about how to get back to work safely and all the different facets of that. Hello everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. So where would you like to be, uh, begin? Now I'm, I'm first going to say that I'd like to kind of steer clear of the political aspect of, of this discussion, because I think it's sort of pointless because uh, everyone has a point and there's a middle ground in there somewhere that we're gonna have to find together. Uh, and there's gonna be some pain involved in it. And mm -hmm. we do have to balance all these considerations. And so somebody's gonna start first. We've got some states like Georgia that have already gone back to tattooing. And this includes some artists who are very conscientious, intelligent people. Uh, who no doubt are going to be doing everything possible. So I'm curious to know uh, if you were a shop owner right now and you were getting ready to reopen your doors, what are some of the first things that you would do differently than compared to uh, last year? Well, I am a shop owner. So all of this and everything I'm, you know, it's putting, you know, trying, like you said, there's so many levels of, of, of what's going on here and trying to separate um, and disseminate all this information that's coming at us and, and keep it health focused, health based. Um, that's, that's the name of the game, um, is how are we going to do what we do safely? Um, for ourselves, I mean, general public is important too, but artists have an exponentially higher, always have had a much higher risk um, of exposure than, than clients do. So um, like you said, we anyone in the industry, who, practice standard precautions we, we've taken it upon ourselves to to make sure that we're making every effort and taking every effort to to reduce and minimize our risk right we know this is a risk industry we know that when we start um, and everything we do from the time we walk in till the time we leave is is risk mitigation and it's um, adding those protective layers of, of minimizing our, our risk to hopefully get us down to a point where, our risk is manageable and, and, and where we can, with the proper protections and protocols in place, do what we do safely, right? Um, but there's always going to be a risk. So there's no 100% safe way to do anything, including driving a car or any, anything, but especially in a studio environment. The, the big twist and change that this has over, say, hepatitis or MRSA or, or the things we've traditionally dealt with is it's brand new to the human species. So it's, we're still learning um, uh, well, how, how is this virus going to mutate and, and change and, and you know, they're treatment wise and we're, you know, they're still finding different, uh, you know, aspects of how it attacks the body and, and what have you. So, you know, um, but all we can do like in, in our environment is, is know that risk exists, know it's a very real risk and logically, um, break down what are the best steps we can take to, to protect ourselves. Okay. Well, so, the big, the, the big change compared to other risks that we've dealt with in the past, that those have primarily been bloodborne and surface mm -hmm. type problems. Now we're, uh, entering into airborne, uh, which is totally different. I mean, it, it's, it's intimidating. It is. And we're, we're all, and that's, I guess that was my Point, we're all pretty well versed in how to handle the 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 bloodborne exposure right it's, it's that airborne component that is going to be the the new level of minimization the new level of uh, per, personal protective equipment the 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 added layer another added layer of of you know protocols and surface barriers and you know um, how we're protecting ourselves and you know how we're 
taking the time I, you know, before a client's appointment, the day before, you know, getting a hold of people and, and asking them some, you know, some questions. How are you feeling? Have you had any exposure? Have you traveled to try to, again, before the client even gets here, minimize, but taking into and, and appreciating the fact that a symptomatic client is, is actually our best defense if we can catch them before they ever get here. Or and if they if someone's symptomatic, we know there's something going on. It's the asymptomatic client. It's the fact that people can contract this and, and have it for weeks and have no idea they have it. And and at some point, someone is going to tattoo someone asymptomatic and, and that exposure is going to happen. So it's, it's approaching our back to work strategy in a way that that's where we're operating from is, is taking, again, that standard precautions approach where everyone's infected, everyone's right. an asymptomatic carrier. And if we're following that in protocol, um, that's the safest way I feel um, to go about it. So now in terms of actual state regulation type things um we're probably going to have to be ahead of that and hopefully uh as with many states have we'll be able to get them to listen to us and say listen these are the precautions we have taken this is as thorough as we can come up with uh in a way that can actually be implemented and uh, <clears throat> let's consider that when rewriting the law and Hopefully it'll be like that. No, as, as it stands right now, there's been no changes that I know of, correct? This correct. early stage. And, and just as pre-COVID, when you look state to state and sometimes county to county within a state, there's such a lack of consistency and not just consistency, but you know, there's, there's rules and regulations being written by people and, and enforcing by people that aren't, they don't know what we do. <laughs> They're not familiar right, with right. what we do. And so it's unrealistic and sometimes not even safe. And so it's not what's happening to us. It's what we do with what's happening to us right now. And this is the time for, for tattooing to, you know, we're all batting for the same team here. Um, every artist is different. Every shop runs differently. Um, no one is telling anyone how to run their business, you know, or apply their art form per se. It's a matter of coming to a, a, a common consensus a consciousness of, of of we all love what we we love that this is our it's not it's not just a livelihood you know what i mean it's it's a lot deeper than that and we have the opportunity like right now if we can get a consistent base of knowledge out there because tech, health departments don't know they don't know they don't know what the hell they're doing on a public health <laughs> uh, platform right now let alone us we're always the afterthought for those people. You know what I mean? So now is the time if we don't want to be overregulated or uh, outregulated to somehow come to a, a, an agreement, you know? And I think it's a matter of, you know, it shouldn't be a, a dictated, this is what you have to do. It's, it's coming to a collective agreement of, you know, yes, this is best practice, but this is a safe safe minimum practice there has to be a safe minimum if you choose to go above minimum man more power to you but below that minimum safe practice is dangerous and and to understand where your risks are and where you are dangerous so not just saying you have to wear an n95 mask but why you know understanding why these things are coming into play and how they best protect you i think is important in getting that message out for compliance. well and also just like with using gloves and understanding that the way you put them on and take them off matters, you know, we're going to have to kind of work through the whole routine, not just with the mask, but some people are wearing those net gaiters over the mask, which, you know, can provide extra protection and it looks cooler, but you know, there's more handling. So all of this stuff, we're going to have to work out our, our smooth procedures and yeah, this is uh, new territory. You know, no, it's, yeah, so I guess there's probably going to be some, you know, very soon we're probably going to be seeing some specific like instructional videos of, of artists showing how they do all this stuff. And, and I mean, we are an industry that's really good about sharing this kind of information. Hopefully word will get out quickly. And, uh, you know, although some people disagree with states like Georgia about starting early, they are going to be the places that uh, are going to try these things out first. 
and right. they're going to have valuable things to share with us, their successes and failures. Learning curve. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, so we're here in Illinois. Uh, the, the one thing that legally has changed, and of course, we're still on lockdown for one more month uh, as an industry here, but then we're going to be expected any, uh, any industry that brings you closer than six feet that you'd be wearing masks. And of course, that would be us. And there would be no exceptions for any industry. So, you know, it'd be ridiculous that anyone here would want to argue it, but there are those that will. Uh, and just like when latex gloves came into use, there were those that argued that, I'm sure. And uh, there were the ones that, that did it last. And then, of course, there are going to be those that are going to never feel comfortable without it ever again. Yeah. And I think that's where the education component plays is so important. And that if it's if it's just dictated that this is the protocol now and this is what you have to do with no understanding of why that's in place, um, there's going to be a lot more pushback with that versus this is all about protecting the artist. Yes, we're we need to protect our clients, too. And there's steps there. But, you know, I've always held true to the the opinion that if, if the artist is is protecting themselves at, at the best level possible the client is more than safe in that environment because the the exposure risk is 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 the majority of it you know 90 percent of it is on the artist not the client right well and this is one of the interesting things about masks that that has been discussed as the idea that you're protecting others as much as you're protecting yourself if not more and there was this analogy and maybe you've seen it i saw this posted earlier kind of funny, the, the the peeing analogy. Let's say you and another person are both naked and that person pees on you. You get all the pee on you, right? If you're wearing pants and they're not and they pee, you'll still get a lot of it soaking through. But if they're wearing pants when they pee, almost all of it's going to be stopped by their pants. End of story, right? So, <laughs> I mean, not to, make, not to make a joke out of it, but the protection is very much two-way and um, you know, just like with putting disposable barriers over your surfaces, you may have done an excellent job of, of cleaning and sanitizing those surfaces, but by putting that additional protection, you're not only minimizing how much of your new client's blood is getting on that surface, but you're also uh, stopping any spots that you might have missed from coming through from your previous clients. So there's that two-way protection. And uh, we, we need to accept that and uh, you know, be okay with it, it even though it's, uh, it may not be comfortable for everybody at first. Change is never comfortable for, for anyone. And you know, I don't like it anybody any more than anyone else does, you know? but it's, it's, it's wrapping your head around the, the, the benefit of that change. You know? and, and once we, we grasp that and, and we, we get ourselves more familiar with this uncharted territory and you know i don't think we're ever going to be comfortable you know because the 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 risk is always there but definitely educated and aware and proactive instead of reactive you know um that it's it's going to be okay you know we're going to be okay and we're going to we're going to find we're going to find the way and it's going to take you know again, that, that collective, there's no one person that has all the answers. There's just not. And there's so many levels to all of it that, you know, there's always going to be a, a situation or a scenario that you just can't plan for. Like, look where we are in the world right now. You know what I mean? It's, so it's, it's trying to just, you know, have plan to be proactive instead of reactive, I guess is the best way I can say it. And, and like you said, taking every precaution and, and every additional measure you can take. Um, but again, you know, you don't want to, we're not trying to be in, you know, full on bio respirator suits to tattoo. I think that's a little over, you know what I mean? A little, a little over. Yeah. Well, so where is that healthy minimal or healthy? There's going to be, there's going to be different circumstances too, I think. Uh, for example, we may find that, COVID becomes a seasonal thing that after a while it kind of settles into a seasonal pattern and that additional precautions are going to be necessary during that season. And you can go back mm -hmm. to your standard precautions at, at the time when that's not going on. And uh, it's probably going to become standard precautions to wear masks all year. 
I think that that's just going to be become such a thing for every industry that, uh, and of course, when it's off season, we'll have our masks off when we're at the counter and talking to people and all that stuff. Uh, and when it's season and is on, we're going to be very airtight about it. Uh, I think mm -hmm. as, a, as a civilization, we're going to be adapting to this thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I would like to invite Jesse Nessie on now. Uh, he's uh, another person with a lot of experience with uh, health regulations and safety. Uh, hey, Jesse. Hey there. How's it going? Going good. Uh, what do you think of our conversation so far? And what do you have anything specific to say about anything that's been brought up yet? He just pulled me in. So I just started hearing you guys. I didn't catch what's been said. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so uh, where we're at now is we've just started talking about the fact that we're going to be making these big changes in our industry and that they're uh, likely to be permanent. We're, we're not going to, I don't think, and most scientists don't think we're going to get done with COVID and leave it behind us. We're, we're now going to have it as part of our, our uh, pulse. Uh, probably we're going to have a COVID season the way that we have a flu season. But first, it may take up to a couple of years for it to settle into that kind of a pattern. It's going to have to rampage its way through our civilization a couple times in order to settle into that season. We're going to have to find that sort of herd immunity. So we're going to have to find all these different ways of doing business just in order to keep existing as a, as a profession. And uh, obviously wearing masks is just the beginning of it. I'd, I'd like to hear what you would have to say uh, if if you were opening your shop tomorrow and uh, you had a list of things that you're doing differently, what would what would those things be? Right, right, definitely. That's part of what we've been working on. Uh, I don't know how much uh, you guys have already talked about kind of what we've been working on behind the scenes, but uh, I've been on Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting since we stopped being in our studios. Um, I'm involved with, uh, I'm on the board of directors for the Alliance of Professional Tattooists, and I'm also involved with a couple alphabet soup groups, the uh, AFDO, the Association of Food and Drug Officials, which I got invited to by uh, piercer Steve Joyner, who most of you guys probably know. Um, Steve's so awesome with APP over the years that he felt like he kept getting asked to speak about tattoo-related things and just didn't feel like he was quite the expert. And when he originally hit me up to be a part of this group, I said, dude, out of everyone, you know, why, why me? You know, I'm kind of Joe nobody to a lot of people. And, and he said that he knew me well enough to know that I could speak in English and I could, uh, you know, be eloquent when I need to on occasion. Um, but also that I gave a shit, um, excuse the language. It's the best way I can phrase that one after just saying I'm eloquent, but, uh, the, uh, you know, there's, there's so many of us that, when I first showed up in the tattoo industry, you and several other people were instantly cool talking to me about things, told me about, you know, kind of what I needed to know as a new dude showing up. Several people gave me smart advice, like, just, just don't just leave. <laughs> uh, 20 years later, I'm still around. Uh, but uh, I did feel like it, it, it's at the point where a lot of the people who've kind of carried the weight for 40 plus years, making sure tattooing was as safe and up to date as possible are at the age where they're they're either retiring from tattooing some of the people have been you know some of your mentors things like that um or they're at the point where we those of us who are in our 40s or so and those who are younger really need to pick up the ball and take care of tattooing the way it's taking care of us so part of what i started doing is just trying to be a fly on the wall to hear any feedback coming from these groups make sure that we were being spoken for as as an industry and as practitioners mostly um, there were several manufacturers involved and whatnot, but I wanted to make sure that we, the artists, had a, a speaking voice in there. Um, so I've been in these meetings and I've been trying to kind of have everybody's voice, not just my opinion. Um, I've stated a few opinions about the people who are concerned about having to wear masks at all, just to make sure that it's in the mix in the conversation being said. Um, I'm going to get used to it, but I'm not thrilled at all about it. Um, I, I don't think that the masks are going to necessarily work as well as we'd like them to in the close proximity that we are with people. Um, if I spend four hours with somebody, unless we're both wearing perfectly fitted and 95 masks, it's, it's not likely that they're going to protect people. Um, that being said, whatever steps we can take are what's important to take. So I'm going to be wearing a mask. Absolutely. Whether I feel like it's going to be the most comfortable option or not. 
Um, I'm mostly worried about the fact that I'm pretty chatty. Um, I like to talk to my clients all day long. I'm not in the generation where I put a uh, pair of headphones on and ignore somebody. Um, I know that's something that you're all about too, Guy, because uh, I know you like to specifically schedule people that you can have a good conversation with. Find a good mask that you can talk under. That There are such things. Uh, you'll get comfortable with it. It feels weird at first, you know, but uh, you'll get comfortable with it. And it, it isn't necessarily going to limit your conversation. You know, the sense of connection with the client, of being able to see each other's face. You know, unfortunately, this is just where we're at. You know, we're, we're going to have to, you know, there's also the face shields. But of course, that's something you would almost wear in addition to a mask, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, you would have to have a complete shield with a respirator to, you know, replace the function of a mask. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't understand what the different reasons for wearing a mask are. And a lot of tattoo artists being new to this don't quite realize um, if you're wearing a mask because you're worried about your cough compromising somebody else, then all you need is a mask. If you're worried about somebody else coughing in your face, then you absolutely have to wear a mask and some kind of eye protection. It's mandatory by OSHA at that point. Um, so it really comes down to why we're wearing the mask. Each wearing a mask to protect the other person, eye protection is kind of yes or no. Um, if we're wearing a mask to protect us personally, the eye protection is essential. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think that. I think that having both both parties wearing a mask is, I mean, if there's any chance, like if it's during a season when there's a lot of COVID cases, that would be a bare minimum. You would have to have both the client. And, and so uh, some of the shops that I have seen opening, that's one of the things they're asking. If you show up and you don't have a mask, one will be provided for you. Uh, and there's a lot of just minimization of interaction and of contact. Like, you know, in-person consultations are going to be either a thing of the past or very minimized. Uh, you're not going to be bringing your friend or your spouse. Um, some of the shops that are opening now aren't allowing you to wait in the waiting room. You wait in your car and we'll let you know when we're ready for you. Um, it, just, uh, you know, every everything that can be done to minimize that, uh, that contact and, um, Ultimately, you are sitting with this one person for many hours, though, and they could be asymptomatic. And even during that asymptomatic period, there's a lot of virus breeding in the throat. So I don't know what you can do beyond that. Uh, if you've got really good ventilation in the room, maybe, or if that's just going to be pulling it past your face faster, it's uh, that's a tough one. That's, one. that's one we've researched quite a bit. Um, we didn't. Both of the different groups, both the APT and uh, the BAEA, I didn't mention earlier, it's a spinoff group from the AFDO. BAEA is Body Art Education Alliance. Um, that's a group that we formed for APP, APT, different health organizations, and AFDO to all work together. So uh, between BAEA and AFDO, uh, we came up with a recommendation for phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, the APTs, we kept a little bit more basic um, we really want to make sure absolutely that people could fulfill what they what they wanted on there we didn't want to put something in about air filtration since so many of us can't affect that in our buildings right um, with a lot of us being renters not owning our spaces there are some in in studio uh units that we've been looking at um we one of our board members uh, or ex-board members don will probably have an article available pretty soon comparing different units um there's there's one for about a thousand dollars. That's probably a decent unit with charcoal capture, UV light in there, uh, changes the uh, air in a space every four minutes. Things like that obviously are a little bit out of most of our price range after just missing two months of work. But there are things that we might want to look at in the future as far as really getting our spaces to what we want to for these things. Uh, yeah, actually, we've we've got that in our house is uh, is a, a pair of really high power UV bulbs, and even when we're not running the climate control, I always have the house air getting pushed past that just to, cause you know, we have a lot of mold and stuff that grows out here in the country and that, that helps yeah. you know, neutralize some of that. When we bought our house, we had two units put into our HVAC system. So we've got the right. same kind of thing just built Bingo. in. Bingo. Yep. 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 So here, here's a question in your shop. Do you have an open plan or does each artist have their own room? We're, we're open. We each have a, a pretty large space and we have half walls, but I've, and I'm so chatty. I like talking to the client that my friend, you know, that my other artist is tattooing. I like talking to the other artists. So 
that's gonna be one of the changes that we're gonna make at this point as I'm doing a few switching around things at the studio. So we'll probably be a little more private room set up. Um, we've got one private, well, we have two private rooms. One of them's just been used as a photography studio for a while, but uh, we'll probably, I, I just, luckily I have a small studio. Uh, I'm our primary artist and I've got one other artist who's going towards full time. Gotcha. Um, so we have a pretty easy time being separate, even if we were going to stay in the open plan. But, okay. Uh, so I, I, I also wanted to ask Chris the same question. Chris, you're still here, right? I'm still here. All right. So uh, your studio, uh, it's, it's a very long established studio. Now, is it um, a, an open plan kind of situation there too, or is it separate rooms? Uh, we have separate rooms with the exception of, um, initially they were all separate rooms and because we are very social animals at, at one point we decided to um take down a wall and make one room into a big room with two stations right um but each but the majority of the rooms are separated and and even in the, in the big room um you know there there are ways to cost effectively you know whether that's you know running you know you know, some type of a, a wire and vinyl shower, shower curtain, something that can be, you know, cleaned and disinfected that, that can be pulled across. Um, you know, there are, are definitely ways to, to separate those open floor plans where you're not having to, you know, invest in a complete build out uh, to do so. But a huge change for us is, you know, we've, we've always been a street shop with custom ability and we're in a big 10 college town. So going to appointment only, um, you know, we've always taken appointments, but we, we've allowed walk-ins, so that that will cease. Um, that's going to be a huge change in, in how we're we're approaching everything for sure. Yeah, the the walk-in thing. Now, what do you think uh, is going to be the next best way to connect with new clients if walk-ins aren't really a thing anymore? I think we all have the benefit of social media these days. That you know and in years past, we did not have, um, and like what we're doing right now, um, whether that's the Zoom call, and there's so many platforms because of, of necessity, um, just in education alone, um, with teachers and what have you, of, of being able to reach, you know, clients. So, like you said, doing consultations, um, uh, still being able to face to face interact, but maybe not physically be in the same room uh, with people. Um, and you know, I, I hope at some point once we get a handle on this again, it's probably going to be a year or two, um, that, that you may, may be able to allow, you know, with limited, with control, obviously, um, walk-ins again, but as that might be, we don't know, we don't know, but that might be a thing of the past for everybody. And, you know, yeah. staggering yeah. appointments, allowing that extra time, you know, how long your procedure is going to take, but, you have to add additional time to make sure that everything, you know, cleaning, disinfection, possibly shutting down, you know, midday for for an hour or so, just to, you know, give an overhaul to everything, um, you know, yes. from point of entry to point of exit, things are, you know, there's gonna be levels of, of protection we just haven't had before. Right, so, you know, with that, that subject in mind, uh, I've invited Derb Morrison, uh, who runs True Tattoo Supply to uh, come on. He's made a lot of posts recently about new PPEs that they are experimenting with in their catalog. And of course, this is, this is a gold rush industry. So there's all this new stuff. And uh, Derb is also a guy that you know takes feedback and tries to come up with new things, uh, not just using things that are already available out there. Uh, I don't know if he's online right now, but he'll be popping in pretty soon. He is online and, uh, and what's okay. up, everyone? Hey, hey Derb. Derb. How you guys doing? Oh, we're yeah. doing good. Thanks for joining us. Heck yeah. Oh, there you All are. All right, got this thing working. I don't know what background. I think I got Darth Vader back there or something. Awesome. That's for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> How you guys doing? Everybody hanging in there? Yeah. yeah. So uh, what is the plan for reopening Red Tree? Uh, when does that happen? And uh, what is the, I guess, the law in Ohio right now? Yeah, well, I mean, there's no real tentative date to open Red Tree right at the moment. Um, it just keeps getting pushed back by the governor. You know, at this point, we understand it's probably going to be June 1st. Could be longer, depending on what's going to go on. But um, as far as reopening, we are already um, sent some things into, into um, motion uh, with reopening. 
a lot of it's going to be hand sanitizer uh hand sanitizing areas and things like that um before you even come into the studio we're going to have some of them like hand and body wipes just disinfecting wipes that uh, the main thing is going to be the hands obviously and then make sure that every client has masks on uh you know before they even enter the door so there's going to be procedures as the clients enter the doors for sanitation um, they have to provide their own masks if not we obviously have them at the studio as well then when you enter um, we're, we're also doing pre uh, all the release forms are going to be done before the client even shows up so nobody's sharing pens or anything like that so we're switching to online digital release forms that the uh, artists are going to be sending off to their clients before they even show up so everything's kind of done client will come in go up to the room there's also another sanitation uh, shelf with um, you know hand sanitation uh, stuff that'll be there for them and then pretty much uh, it's up to the, the artist to contain the client we're separating the artist restroom from the client restroom um, and then pretty much like we're already a private studio so that'll be I don't think that's going to be a factor because there's already social distancing at the studio with it being so big. If we need to, we'll expand into our lower part of the studio to to make more distancing for people. What um, kind of distance do you have right now? Right now, our separate booths, each artist is probably about eight to 10 feet apart, separate rooms across hallways, things like that. Uh, there is one booth in particular I've already got my eye on that I'm moving the, the one chair further away. Um, but right now, social distancing at the studio is is not an issue uh, whatsoever. It's mainly we're concerned about the procedures that the state's going to want uh, upon entry of of any studio. Um, no walk ins, things like that, which were appointment only already. Consultations and and pre client artist talks are going to be a big thing. How you feeling? What's your temperature like? You know things like that. Um, staying closer contact about your your health and your client's health together. If artists do get exposed to somebody that that had it, um, you know they're going to be quarantined and asked to, you know, stay away and things like that. If a client has knowingly had it and recovered, uh, we're going to want a doctor's note. Uh, I think that's going to be one of the things too. If you've actually had it, to to because we don't know how contagious it is for how long, things like that. So um, little requirements like that. I actually have on if you go to RedTreeTattoo.com. And you click over to about, I actually have created a COVID-19 guidelines thing that actually states a lot of these stages and steps that we're doing. So you'll find a whole client requirements, you'll find artist requirements, and then you'll see some other stuff that's, uh, that's been presented um, to the state of Ohio, to the governor, actually, through that petition. That was going okay. Around. Okay. What was that link again? Uh, Redtreetattoo.com. Okay. Okay. Yep. So. And then you'll see all uh, that. If I remember my history correctly. Uh, Ohio was one of the first states where the state regulators, this is back before there were a lot of tattoo regulations at all, hmm. uh, where the state regulators actually met with and listened to uh, tattoo artists in shaping the, uh, the tattoo legislation. And in hmm. fact, that was the bill that ended up being used as a model for many other states, including here in Illinois. I was on that panel of artists uh, back in 1998. Actually, there was, uh, I think it was like 20 artists that were on that panel back then that all came together. Yeah, and it was taken from other laws from other states and stuff like that and refined. Um, yeah, that was back in 1998. A lot of things have been revised and edited with addendums to it, to the body art uh, document here in Columbus. Like at one point, disposable tubes, because they weren't written into law, legally you weren't allowed to use even use disposable tubes. So that's one thing that I... I didn't have really an invested interest, but it just made more sense to, to right. get that disposable tubes in the law. So right. I'm sure there's going to be different regulations. The body art documents probably going to change a little bit here in Ohio for sure. So uh, I'd like to pop back to Chris for just one second. Uh, Chris, do you think that uh, there needs to be, or maybe there already is uh, a time, uh, you know, a, an effort among the industry in every state to sort of get together and uh, figure out what these changes should be and uh, get ready to talk to state regulators? Uh, what do you think is the best way for them to go about doing that? Man, that's, 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 that's the big one, right? So um, coming together in, as an industry um, is, is, imp is imperative really, you know, to get that, to get a, like we said earlier, uh, a consensus of, of 
what is best for us and how do we want to be regulated and to have that say instead of it coming from external sources um, that aren't in the, as you say, the front lines every day. Um, you know, so platforms and, and they're being created as, as they're needed and, and happening now. Um, tattooing Beyond COVID um, just launched last week. And, and I know many people are working on, on things. And, and if there's some way that, you know, uh, getting, and I'm not even saying like-minded because nobody, not saying we should all think the same or do the same, but it's, it's health-based. What is the safest, healthiest way to protect ourselves so that we, we, we can take this opportunity to put a consistent set of guidelines out there, um, not requirements, not telling anybody what to do, but these are guidelines. Again, you know, this is, you know, safest minimum practice. This is, you want to go above that, you know, this is best practice, but this is dangerous, you know, and, and um, trying to put forth a, a cohesive set of, of guidelines that are somewhat consistent that say this is, you know, from the industry, this is the safest way we feel, um, you know, this is the safest way to go about from here forward. Because again, like you said, it, in a few years from now, once there's better control on this, it, it, it may be taken down to a risk level of, of seasonal flu, but it's also more contagious regardless. So yes. during that season, you know, there are going to be more considerations, but in the interim from here to then, and we don't know when then is um, because the virus dictates that we don't um, we're on its timeline really, you know? And so how do we manage and mitigate our risks and, and, and minimize there's no elimination of, there's no complete elimination of risk, right? There's right. Steps well, we take just like before, it. just like mm -hmm. before yeah, there yeah. was never, never complete, but you know, I think that most people in the industry had gotten very comfortable with the level of risk and the type of management that we were, uh, doing for it, and uh, we could probably arrive at some kind of uh, equilibrium like that with this as well. So I guess, long story short, anyone out there who is interested in uh, being involved in your state's effort to get together uh, people in your industry and talk to the state regulators and make sure that any future changes that are going to happen are not stupid. Um, I guess, uh, Chris, you think maybe start with uh, that group you had just mentioned, Tattooing Beyond COVID, or uh, Jesse, you got any recommendations? And collaborating with existing, you know what I mean? We have professional organizations, um, and but, you know, and even uh, on those, there, there are some, there's lack of consistency. So it's a matter of trying to work, you know, from within the industry first. I think the key is, and, and with the, you know, groups like that is that it is it's tattooers you know it's it's tattooers trying to have open conversations um and and every situation like i said every scenario is different every studio is different every artist is a little different so there's no one person that's going to be able to come out and say this is the way yep. we do it it's yeah well be and, and there's going to be some trial and error too as for, well. sure, for uh, sure for sure so before i lose this train of thought uh, i wanted to go back to derb so what are some new things, some new PPEs? Now, this is something we hadn't even thought of that term before, PPEs, like okay, uh, personal, pro again here. Oh, yes. personal protection equipment. And the things that we're used to using, obviously, would be gloves. Some of us, uh, like I, I've been using these aprons, uh, the got you covered aprons uh, for the, the last uh, couple, uh, you know, year or so. And I really like those. I feel a lot yeah. better protected. Uh, I don't feel like uh, I have to ditch my clothes as soon as I walk in the house like I used to. Yeah, you tattoo you know? very covered every time I've been tattooed, full sleeves and everything. So what are some new things that, that you've got at, uh, um, at True Tattoo Supply that, that are you know new technologies or new uh, things being offered? Yeah, we, well, we just kind of started. It, it's funny because clientele kind of flipped, you know, when, when tattooing was kind of shut off. Um, it's switched purely to medical supplies, really. Uh, all we were selling was like matticide wipes, gloves, um, masks when we had them in, but those sold out within within days. Man, I um, stocked up on Ergo Squish before any of this happened just to make sure you weren't going to run out. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's it's been pretty crazy. Yeah, masks, you know, they sold out pretty fast. Um, so we actually, I mean, I said it to my manager. I was like, it's a time where, you know, like we obviously need to focus a little bit more on carrying more medical supplies now. 
as well as tattoo supplies. And it's funny because from like an inside perspective, I could see just everything switch over and tattoo supplies kind of stopped. You know, they're they're selling again now and you can see the industry picking up a little bit in certain states. Um, but things that we've added, you know, we're obviously we weren't even carrying uh, just regular disposable masks before. Uh, we now have face shields. Uh, we've increased some of like the the hand sanitation wipes. We now have like uh, more natural ones too. So we have matticide wipes. Then we have just basic hand wipes like tea tree, you know, eucalyptus uh, wipes. What else we got here? Um, a lot of the more medical sprays and stuff like that. Disposable sleeves, like the clear plastic disposable sleeves, just for more uh, more coverage. Uh, aprons, pretty much full artist covering. The uh, face shields are something that some of my artists are going to wear. Um, some of them are going to wear masks. Some of them are going to wear probably the face shields like Fawn. I know Fawn wants to wear the the face shield that she has and things like that. Um, other than that, you know, um, we are looking into carrying uh, more, you know, more masks again, rubbing alcohol, prep pads, things like that. So, um, yeah, I think the artist covering is going to be a big thing, just covering themselves a little bit more, not just for our safety, but for the comfort of the clients and things like that. Um, but it, I think that the clients are also going to be kind of wearing masks. You sure. know, they might bring in their own face shields um things like that so but yeah um, when you go to the dentist you don't expect them to be there in your their street clothes you want to see them covered with an covered. apron and everything else it's uh, yeah so i think it's going definitely in, in more of that context well we've seen artists certain artists like gunner's been wearing masks and stuff we've seen him yeah. tattoo him pretty heavily covered so we have seen this you know certain uh you know certain artists that have been way more covered and it's kind of kind of come in full mm -hmm. circle and make it some now some chinese artists actually i've been seeing wearing masks for yeah. a couple of years and, and exactly you know of course uh they're you know obviously uh they deal with viruses more than we do because of their population and everything else mm -hmm. yeah so uh um i'd like to invite somebody else on uh litos uh he's down in florida florida yeah. is opening up right and so uh, i'd like to hear a little bit about what that experience is like uh, litos are you still around Where are you you might be trying to connect for a couple of years, and yeah, exactly. You know, of course. Oh no, uh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kudos, <laughs> you need to turn off the stream. Yeah. So, I'll turn uh, off the stream, um, please. I'd like to somebody else on, uh, Litos. Uh, he's down in Florida. There you go. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. What's up, everybody? All right. What's up, dude? Uh, Pretty interesting there. So that's the mask and sh uh, shield together. And of course you could still, you know, air could flow under the chin or that sort of thing. But if somebody sneezes in your face, you're good. Uh, yeah, the but I, just for a lack of, you know, for conversation here, just uh, to, yeah, it's, it is a, a new normal thing that actually some people actually are already using, like Japan is mandatory. And there's a lot of things that we actually try to implement it here, because if you really go to the uh, CDC uh, suggestions okay. for everybody mm -hmm. there, um, it's kind of lacking. We are already way ahead of the game because, you know, just another day in the office, we have these precautions, the, all the medical uh, cleaning supplies and everything else. Um, I've been trying to communicate with uh, our governor because the phase one starts now Monday. And unfortunately, we uh, fall in the same spectrum as the uh, barbershops and massage parlors, anything in proximity. Um, it's not really fair when we are so, uh, you know, training blood board patches and cross contaminations and everything else to be staple at the same thing. Because if somebody can actually go to a restaurant and sit at the table with multiple people, have somebody bring the, the food to you, in that proximity, it kind of deserves the purpose. What we try to do, which unfortunately we change our ways. It's like closing the doors by appointment only. Um, when they come in, they would be taken. We have infrared um, thermometer that their temperature will be tested before they enter the premises. Uh, also us, when we come in, our artists will be tested for the temperature. We have, um, you know, arm sleeves, um, gowns, the face shield is actually the only way for us to protect ourselves like surgeons do is either having those walls that you'll put your arm through, which 
you know, it can't be functional that way. So we felt that the actual shield, you wearing the shield and the mask, it's a double protection plus the client as well using that and making that mandatory. I know it's a pain as it's just something that is just very uncomfortable, but for time period, it's going to be necessary. We need to kind of a, try to kind of go way beyond what everybody's using it because our industry is already uh, obviously changed quite a bit over the years. Um, but we have to be an example to separate ourselves from the other ones that actually don't have to be as intense as we do. Right. So um, let me uh, just get my facts straight here. You're uh, legally able to open on Monday. Is that no, not no, up. No, okay. We, not up. Okay, so. Yeah, probably the phase two. And hopefully okay. phase two, like, you know, Durbo was saying, we don't know. We don't have a date. So mm -hmm. hopefully nobody on the phase one screws it up. Uh, the phase mm -hmm. two will be the next step. So that's what we're hoping sure. for. But I created some guidelines uh, that were sent to Governor um, DeSantis in Florida. <laughs> and hopefully get somebody to look at them and maybe uh, bring our date for opening, not that we're rushing to do anything, uh, to have more of a different outlet to how we conduct business. And it is, again, even though the doors are open, if you don't feel comfortable opening your studio, that is your prerogative, that's completely fine. I might not feel comfortable at all, but I am going way beyond uh, way to protect ourselves, you know, my crew and my clients and my family, uh, because that's all it takes. You know, you can be negative today and you can be positive five minutes from now. So you always have to be with the guards up, you know. The, yeah. the thing that I think we can we can draw some kind of confidence from is that there are a lot of physicians who are right in the heart of the front lines that are religious about their PPEs and they're not getting sick. So. Mm -hmm. We can do the same and we're in a much lower risk environment than they are. Although, you know, you never know what you're dealing with, what, what's walking in the door. We, we have to treat it the same way we've treated everybody's blood as if we're dealing with someone who's infected. Exactly. Yeah, a lot, luckily a lot of us are already trained in a lot of those, you know, bloodborne pathogens, first aid, just basic cross contaminations and the way the viruses can spread through studios. So I think we're already one step ahead of the average like business owner to tell you the truth just because of the nature like you said guy we've been dealing with blood for forever so okay so there's a couple i'm sorry not to uh, interrupt you I, before i forget there's a couple of questions mm -hmm. that are rolling and that we can well the first one derb is specifically for you uh okay. someone's wondering when madicide is going to be back in stock and i guess that question <laughs> would go towards masks and things like that as well since some things are obviously there's been a, a rush on them and they're all yeah. gone uh, are these things going to be like, how's your supply chain looking right it, now? It's funny because suppliers actually slow down a lot too with the heavy demand with the medical supplies. We have more medicide on the, on the way right now, actually. Um, it's more the sprays and the gallons. So we're, we're not getting the wipes back in right away. Same thing with gloves. Like we're, we're lucky. We just got a new pallet of gloves, but it was getting, getting close, you know? So it seems like um, everybody, you know, especially the medical industry is, you know, overwhelmed right now with everything. Um, and it trickles down to even the tattoo supply companies, even trying to get their pallets in. So we should have mat aside this coming week. We should have masks this coming week. Uh, gloves are fully stocked. So we're doing good on that. But um, yeah, it's been a little bit more of a challenge, you know, keeping some of those items in. I don't know if it's because the the manufacturers are slower or if it'd be the just overwhelming demand for the for the items. So, okay, I wanted to just say in general to everyone who's listening right now, uh, we are taking questions. Um, you can uh, type them in at the chat room and uh, we've got somebody kind of, you know, narrowing them down if there's any repeat questions so that, uh, and we'll try to get to the, the most important ones. Uh, uh, Gabe, there was one from Amy Ward. Uh, could you read off that question, please? And uh, it says, even if everyone is tested, how does that address the asymptomatic, asymptomatic client? Right. Okay. So, Litos, let's let's ask you that first. So, you, you've got people getting tested with your infra infrared thermometer, uh, and of course, everyone's being uh, uh, completely covered. Well, you know, all the artists are completely covered, and the clients are. Uh, 
us to wear uh, masks and face coverings. Um, do you think that that is enough to address the large number of people, you know, probably a good proportion of people who you know, actually catch this virus, uh, either uh, don't show symptoms or, you know, walk around for quite a while before they do? Yeah, that's, that's a tricky one because it's an invisible uh, guess, right? And I think the only thing we can do is pretty much is start with the communication with the client beforehand. So the communication becomes through the consult, uh, consultation and asking questions about their medical uh, conditions, if they're being exposed, if they travel from places that were uh, hot zones. I mean, it, just the normal questions you have to say, just to fear off the, the, you know, on the, on the door. Uh, when they come in, if somebody has a higher temperature, obviously it's your choice to tell them, say, you know, unfortunately I can't conduct business with you for these reasons. You know, that has to be established right away in the beginning, ask if you can communicate with them and say, you know what, unfortunately we are taking temperature. That's the number one test that we can do it at the door. And don't feel bad that for our both of our protections that I might send you if you have a higher temperature. That's a start. Uh, and once they enter, having all those things overkill with protection, like they were gonna um, sanitize their hand on entry and what we will ask the, them as well is actually be aware of other things that probably uh, get overlooked. Not only clean their hands, but let's say if they wear glasses, to sanitize their glasses, their cell phone that they're always touching before they enter our premises. I think that you have to kind of do that. Uh, that nobody's going to come in with, uh, with a friend or a family member, unfortunately, for a while. Uh, that minimizes that contact as well. And us keeping both of us protected with shields and masks and gloves and you know gowns and arm sleeves and keeping the distance even when we're inside because in my studio what we did is I'm actually up front and I separated all the the, the studios we have five artists in we have four corners in the back and I'm in the front we have 12 to 15 feet between artists we felt that was safer to do that. So we can conduct business and still keep in mind that nobody goes in the same place at the same time. We take turns and respectfully uh, and safely conduct business. And that's all we can do it at the time, you know. Yeah. So like if you're waiting for the stencil machine, you wait at your workstation until whoever's using it comes out of the stencil Correct. prep area. And you know, just, yeah, just those kinds of things. Yeah, and not only that, let's say we are uh, going to implement some protocol. Let's say if I go in the back and I make a stencil and I use the stencil machine and the copier, it's my job to actually sanitize after I use it. And we made some signs that says this has been cleaned and sterilized for the next client. This way I'll place it in, on top of everything that I touch. This way, the next artist in line don't have to worry. Did he clean it? You know, it's like one of those things. Did you just shut the door? Did you lock the business? You know, so there was no, it can't be a guessing game. It has to be my job to make it comfortable for the next one in line and so on and so on. Yeah, I just, everyone's going to have this extra layer of protection to address. Everyone's going to need to do their part and it's going to become second nature. Yes, and actually, you know, uh, my wife, Julie, she's going to be here present uh, with us and actually overseeing the, the operation, meaning we're going to conduct business with everybody following protocol and she's going to go after between everybody just to double check when the client comes in, she goes in the door, cleans it in and out. Uh, and she's going to be kind of supervising things that get overlooked because I know it's going to be a system that we're not used to it. And we're going to make some mistakes along the way. So if we have a couple eyes to kind of oversee everybody, I think, you know, more the merrier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it kind of reminds me of when uh, it was at one of Paul Booth's conventions. We had uh, all these collaborations going on at once with artists rotating from person to person. And there was somebody whose job was just to make sure everyone, you know, was monitoring there and, and observing the, the separation between the different clients and changing yeah. their gloves. Like if you were changed from the left side of the client to the right side of the same client and you and that other artist trade places, you've got the same gloves on. But if you're moving to the next artist, uh, I mean, the next uh, client is different. Now, if there was so much chaos, we felt, you know what, we should have somebody whose job is just to be on top of that. 
Yeah, and one funny thing, a story, I think, I think you forgot about it, but I'm going to remind you, you know, when I went, you know, to visit you and we, uh, we were doing the collaboration together, we went out, took a break, and we went to that pizza place. And there was a pizza place, the lady was in the back, and she had gloves on. And she was touching other things. And actually, she was going to the other station. And you stop and goes, oh, wait, wait, wait. Did you change your gloves? Because I just seen you going from that place to that place. <laughs> and she stopped and goes, oh, my God. Oh, shit. It's like, and this is like, what was that, 12 years ago or something like that? There was nothing around. But your concern and your attention to detail and actually with that in mind back then, now imagine what our mindset is going to be today and forward. Mm. Well, I mean, honestly, how many of us have had to do that to our dentist? Yeah. Oh, hey, man, could you swap out your gloves, you know? <laughs> Multiple times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've gone through five dentists in the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, any more audience questions right now? Yeah, let's see here. Can, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a bunch of th tons of thank yous from all over the place. Uh, You're welcome, everyone. Let's see. Welcome. There's, welcome. A, there's a couple questions about liability and insurance and adding things to, um, you know, the paperwork. But I think that we probably just have to uh, say, like, talk to your lawyers about all that stuff, unless anyone wants to address particular things they're doing in their releases. Yeah, we, we just added actually the top of our release form, a whole, like, kind of COVID release. Like, I do not knowingly have COVID or been around anybody. It's just a real brief mention right now um that's gonna be part of that digital release form that we'll send to our clients in advance of their their appointment that's about all we've added to our release form uh so far how about you guys uh, um, yeah. i've updated mine uh, you know again trying to work within the form i have and just adding the pertinent information the most important thing with the release is you know nothing's going to protect us 100 percent, but as long as the client um it's clear and concise and they're entering into the agreement to get tattooed with a full understanding of the risks that they're assuming and the rights that they are waiving. Um, and as long as you know, you can spell that out in pretty, pretty basic, straightforward language um, without having to revamp your entire form. Um, every state's going to be different, what you can ask specifically in, in different states. Um, in Michigan, we can't say, do you have anything? Um, we can ask if you have any condition which might affect the healing, but we can't you know, we can't specifically name any disease process. So, um, but you can also imply and get your yes or no on your sign off. Um, mine, they read the top section. They initial that they read the top section. Then they answer the health questionnaire, fill in their information. They, their sig full signature upon filling in their information. So they've already read initial, filled in and signed. And then at the end of the procedure, there's a, a place that says they witnessed everything open in front of them. They had the opportunity to ask questions. They witnessed the needle thrown away in the sharps container, artist initials, client initials. There's a time in and a time out. Um, so if going to court for any liability purpose, they can't say they didn't know because you initialed twice and signed once. You had three opportunities, you know, and you're attesting to the fact that you understand. I read, I understood. Um, and then in order to be considered a, um, consent legally, um, you have to give the client a copy of what they um, informed consent. So if you're sticking with paper releases, definitely look into having them printed on NCR, um, the no carbon forms, so that there's a, you know, the white copy on top, yellow on the bottom, you write on it, everything transfers. And yep. at the end, you're, they're given that hard copy Digital is obviously the way to go if you can go that way. Um, if you're doing paper forms, I've done this for a very long time and that I always, I order like shop pens with styluses on the top to give to people. We give them a new pen with the form and we tell them at that time that the pen is yours to keep. And then they also, who doesn't need a pen and it has a stylus if they're out, you know, touch screening or gas station, you know, they have, a, they have that with them. So, and I'm is happy anyone? to share, every form's different. I'm happy to share what I have, but I, again, with a disclaimer, every state's different, locales are different, check with your attorney before you publish anything. Is there anyone here using the tattoo release form app? No, no. There are a lot of tattoo uh, now people that do, and uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, it, it is a great app. I was just curious to know if they had uh, made any uh, updates as a result of, of COVID yet. 
Um, so, uh, Jesse, do you have any any comments about uh, liability, et cetera? Yeah, a little bit. Um, there's uh, obviously none of our release forms are going to completely absolve us of any kind of liability. The most important thing is showing that we've informed people of what they're getting into and that they have signed off that they, they are aware. So, you know, just exactly what Chris was saying, it's, it's really down to educating them on, you know, what the procedure is, what the risks are. Um, no one can ever sign away the right to sue you. These are just documents to kind of back us up. Um, <clears throat> I really argued in some of the meetings about recommending temperature taking and things like that. And uh, after arguing for a while, people pointed out that it's just going to be a cover our asses thing, you know, because we, we definitely can't tell if somebody has uh, asymptomatic spread of it. Um, the temperature taking is really just to show that as studio owners, we're not being the kind of people to just let Joe 104 degree fever come in off the street. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Really right. Kept yeah. it as simple as possible just to make sure people could achieve them. We didn't want to put that into our recommendations right now because we were worried that people weren't going to be able to get those thermometers. Uh, Nebraska is actually opening some counties to tattoo tomorrow. Uh, my studio could open tomorrow, but I'm choosing not to at this point, both because cases are going up in my local area. I've had a two day argument with a local piercer who's also a nurse about the fact that our recommendations are to change masks between every client, um, which is standard for OSHA PPE. You have to change, you know, any PPE between clients. Um, nurses in my locale in our state are having to wear the same mask all day long through their shift. Um, I've, I've heard of nurses keeping a mask for a week before disposing them because they're so uh, hard pressed. It, it's frightening, especially, you know, if, if folks have masks available for purchase and those hospital CEOs aren't making any less this year, they can go, you know, where they want to go. Um, you know, it, it's just ridiculous that they're acting like there's shortages if there really are at the very minimal, you know, I, I don't consider surgical masks all that great. They're obviously not in 95, but at the very least, they shouldn't be having to wear one of those in between multiple rooms of people. Um, they were actually, he was discussing that they're having to put a mask over their mask if they go into some place at a risk and double gloving has always been stupid. Double masking sounds just as stupid. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I've been arguing with this dude for a week now on what are we going to do next? Not change gloves in between clients. Uh, but he thinks it's strange that we as tattoo artists would have higher standards than they're able to use currently in the medical field. I've been arguing that they're essential and they would have to work with no gloves and no masks if they had to. Whereas we have a choice to keep our studios closed. If we don't have the adequate things to protect our clients. Um, there are ways we can not overuse those things at this point uh, with masks being in short supply. We're planning on uh, using a mask, changing it after each client, but putting it into a paper bag with that artist's name, putting it, setting aside for 72 hours in an area where we could then potentially reuse that mask again. Um, I'm probably going to get a UV light so we can even, you know, try to put those under a UV light. Um, obviously once masks are in, total supply everywhere. I'm just going to throw the things away instead of have to worry about any of that. But um, if my local nurses don't have enough masks, I feel ridiculous trying to use up some of their supplies. Um, I actually purchased a 3D printer and I've got a couple friends who are going to be 3D printing some of the uh, ear savers and things like that, try to distribute those around. Uh, you know, I think anything our studios can do to either purchase from Derb, purchase from the folks who, you know, are, are selling more to our industry than medical places, all the better. Uh, some of the big suppliers like Henry Shine at this point are not letting tattoo suppliers purchase from them the way they normally do. Um, they are specifically routing everything towards medical folks. They're not even letting dentists purchase things right now. Oh, yeah, uh, that's where it's exactly what I'm talking about. Like the demand right. from the medical industry to some of these companies is keeping it from the tattoo industry. Well, and I'm so yeah. glad you guys are stepping up. I'm actually on a list with their uh, their representative will contact me the second tattoo studios are able to purchase for them. And I will make sure everybody knows that one. Um, otherwise I'd rather everyone purchase things from you and keep you doing right. I appreciate uh, that. But uh, yeah, you know, there's problem. definitely some things going on out there that we can do to keep ourselves safer as far as uh, you know, workplace practices. Um, the APT is, you know, we were talking earlier about groups. The Alliance of Professional Tattooists is a trade group for all of us. Um, we're not the tattoo police. We're not telling anybody how to do things. If you don't like how we do things, join the group and have a voice in it. You know, that's the number one way to do things. Here's uh, a question. Um, yeah. uh, since you're involved with the APT, uh, 
could someone approach the APT about helping find or mount an effort uh, in their state to towards uh, you know getting some tattooers together and being able to approach the uh, the lawmakers? Absolutely, we've done a lot of that. Um, you know, when the APT, when people ask kind of what APT does for them, which has always been the big question. Um, in addition to having discounts at several of the uh, the insurance providers, uh, PPIB, things like that, um, that, that more or less just covers your cost of joining. Um, the big thing that APT has done for years, just try to have a unified voice. We actually sent a representative down, one of our ex board members went down to Kentucky when they were gonna pass regulations against tattooing over scars and presented them with several things that they were going over the top in their regulations. Um, Early APT, the idea was to make sure we could regulate ourselves and didn't have any regulation. Obviously, as the decades have passed, regulation is going to happen no matter what. Um, my role as one of the younger people involved for a long time was to really try to bridge that gap between the older, no, screw those people mentality and not have anything to do with regulators and, and try to form some of those relationships. Um, weirdly, I, uh, I got a lot of the uh, pigment uh, manufacturers involved, not weirdly, in, in, on purpose. Uh, I got a lot of the pigment manufacturers uh, involved in the VAEA and AFDO <clears throat> because I was concerned that I was going to say something over the top that would put us all out of business. <laughs> um, I wanted to make sure there was a leash on me to not say dumb shit like, you know, what about sterile bottles and things like that? Uh, well, you know, it's always it's always a great idea to get, you know, as many people involved uh, as, as possible. And, and so that the the unified voice is coming from a broad base. Yeah. So we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. I just, uh, not, everyone not. knows that the different groups that I'm involved in, the BAEA and AFDO, anyone can join. That's not any kind of exclusive thing. If there's artists who really are concerned, if they want to have a voice, if they want to, you know, just find out what's going on, um, they can absolutely hit me up and I can give them the information to join that. It's also been in several APD newsletters just to make sure folks know that they can be connected to these folks too. The best thing that I want to get people information wise out of there is these groups, AFDO and BAEA, even though there are regulatory folks in there, the old idea that they'd want to shut us down is so off the map. These guys really, really want to help us out. They're actually putting in their off time during their jobs. They're, they're doing all these nonprofit group meetings and things, mainly to make sure that we get brought up to speed to be where the food industry is, make sure our pigments have been tested, make sure that we know that they're safe. Um, they're doing some really cool things on that direction to make sure that things like titanium should be a slam dunk to get approved. It's already used in tons of cosmetics. So what they're doing is going through a route to get it approved the same way it is for cosmetics, which obviously is a giant can of worms, could go all kinds of directions. But at the heart of it, I do feel that the people that I'm working with have our best interests in mind. Yeah, nice. this group that you guys are involved, you know, it's the, the what makes a difference is pretty much uniting our forces. And actually, that's what happened in the past when, you know, we had so many regulations. They wanted to close down tattooing because we have to be under supervision of a doctor. So we had to kind of go and lobby to define what that was, change the law to where the doctor didn't have to sit in a tattoo studio. What's happening now is that it's not just this moment. You got to realize all the regulations, all the stipulations for pigments are gonna be even harder. But what's gotta keep in mind is that if we unite a group like we're doing right now and support uh, our, our own and actually derb, you know, that's, you know, people don't know that. Let's say somebody goes in his website and try to order something he doesn't have it, is the fact that he's working really hard to get responses, to get this material and to support mm -hmm. our industry. And people have to understand it's nothing personal. You know, it's not sitting on his ass and not doing anything 24 seven. He's searching for things. So we all searching for things, but what I got to keep in mind is this. Now it's going to be harder to get things in the future because now it, it wasn't just the black glove that only tattoo has had because now it's police officers, it's doctors, it's uh, restaurants, any field that kind of has to have yeah. this kind of barrier. So it's going to be harder to get gloves because all the manufacturers are in Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, and China. So everybody's going to be ordering what we use the most. So keep that in mind. It's not just today. It's going to be an effort for us to understand that it's going to be a lack of. So if you get a hand on something, you've got to support, you know, people like Derb and all the suppliers that are serious in the business to actually support, you know, our industry because, if we have contacts, if we have uh, access to those, 
And keep you another thing in mind, cartridges are made in China, just saying. So it's going to be a lack in there because everybody's going to be buying stuff that we need. Well, so, uh, uh, Cheyenne cartridges are made in India and Germany. So, I mean, they're, they're not all made in, in China. So that there well, are some exceptions. Yeah, that's the great news, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think, um, too, part of your studio protocols and, and the coming back plan is, you know, allowing extra time to place these orders, making sure you're doing an inventory on a, on a regular basis and taking into account that it's not just medical, dental, and, and, and tattooing or body art that needs these needs the PPE. The general public is being told to wear masks. The general public is being told to wear uh, gloves. So now everyone is needing the same things mm -hmm. we've always needed. So placing those orders well in advance, keeping in contact with, with your suppliers to see where their supply chain is, um and not letting yourself yeah. run low yeah well, that's what i was saying earlier low. too it's a it's a very different um it's de definitely a different industry for all of us you know as far as actually tattooing but yeah from the inside from the supplier point yeah it's it's changed it's not as easy to get stuff like Lito was saying like the i, I think the manu the manufacturers are going to step up their pace too i would expect yeah i think that every i mean this happens so quickly that it, i mean it just took everybody by storm every industry by storm so i think that people right now are trying to step it up i know even toilet paper manufacturers are trying to step up their supply so it'll it'll eventually catch up but right now like Lito said like people that were not wearing gloves yesterday are now wearing gloves and masks and so that's putting an overwhelming demand on just that the whole medical industry so i'm sure they'll catch up but i mean this happened so quickly for all of us it changed life it changed the industries it changed careers you know and and it, as long as it's been that we've all been kind of isolated it's still at the at, at the beginning of reorganizing and, and figuring out how how uh life is now yeah well yeah. just like everything else that's happened you know the, this industry has just gotten stronger through all its challenges yeah. there's no reason why it's going to be any different with this uh, I feel like this little break that we've all had to take, there's been a chance to do a lot of rethinking and uh, reprioritizing. And a lot of us are going to, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of us are going to come out of this with, you know, an updated approach, not just, you know, wearing PPEs, but everything about, uh, you know, like even what you, if, if you're not going to be tattooing as many people, uh, maybe being more picky with the projects you take and focusing more on building your artistic strengths uh, so that you can have a more specialized clientele and, and not have to work on as many walk-ins, things like that. I mean, we're, we're all going to have a chance to, to go back into it uh, with kind of a, you know, the, the curtain is closed and reopened and what's this new scene going to be like? Um, hey, do we have time for uh, one more question? Yes, we do. One. Okay, fantastic. There's a, a couple people that are asking about how everyone's addressing the difference. You know, this is now a, an airborne uh, virus as opposed to bloodborne. And so uh, while acknowledging that not everybody is in a control over their airflow and their environment, people are asking uh, about air purifiers, additional ventilation, and, and ultimately, um, you know what? What do we need to do differently now that this is a uh, air could be aerosol aerosol aerosolized? Sorry, my pronunciation. Yes. Point being, okay, you got it. So uh, maybe every, if everyone could address how they're dealing with that in their studios. Well, first let, let's just recap what we've talked about so far, right? We've got uh, minimization of any unnecessary people in the studio or not coming in until your appointment is <laughs> just about to start, right? So the number of of human hours going on in that studio are kept to the bare minimum of just the artists and their clients while they're tattooing. Uh, we've got the PPA is and preferably both client and artist wearing masks, wearing them properly. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, of course, um, hand Please sanitizer buddies. and things like that as well. Just all, all the things we're doing to just make sure that things are clean in general. But, uh, what could we possibly do beyond that? Now, uh, having good airflow is important, but as we were saying before, uh, you don't want it flowing straight from your client to, towards you because that'll actually increase your risk of uh, inhaling one of their microbes. Like I said earlier, I think a lot of, a lot of it's going to be the, the pre sanitization of the client's hands before they get in, keeping your clients contained. And then, like you said, with the airflow, that's, that's a tricky one. You could have little air purifiers within, 
each little workstation possibly. But I think the cleanup afterwards too. So keeping your client contained and then wiping everything down, giving it time between clients, maybe even, you know, don't do five appointments a day. Just keep it to one, wipe down good and then, and then beat feet, you know, to at, at least get going again. Um, yeah. I, so no. that's a big part of it is clean up after and wipe everything down. I mean, it's, it's hard because most tattoo shops are sort of open plan, right. Or at least mm -hmm. in part. And, and of course that's an important part of it. You know, uh, I would hate to give that up, you know, uh, as, as it stands, like our two workstations are a good distance apart and they're on rolling carts so we can make them farther if we need to, but you know, there's a good 15, 18 feet between, uh, workstations, but, uh, you can't really isolate the air that one pair of people uh, is breathing from, you know, what's going on at the other end of the room. And uh, are we all really ready to partition off all our spaces? And then after each client step out and do a complete air circulation before starting the next client. Uh, I, th I think that this early round of shops reopening and using all reasonable pre uh, precautions with the exception of that, is going to be the only way we can really find out how safe mm -hmm. it is. I don't know. Anyone else have any comments? With yeah, the air circulation. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Sorry, Chris. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say, you know, just like there are many different um, levels and uh, of masks and, and, you know, what they filter out, air filtration is the same, you know, the, the same. So regardless of, of what you're, you know, do your research, do your homework, make sure that, you know, an N95 is much different than a surgical mask, which is much different than an exam mask as far as what percentage of contaminants could, could, could come out. And with air purifiers, it's, it's the same thing, you know, a standard um, one you buy at, you know, Home Depot is going to be a little bit different than the ones that are used in healthcare facilities and medical facilities. Um, also, you know, if you're looking into UV disinfection, definitely, you know, do your homework on that because some of that's really dangerous for, for exposure. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of homework and research to be done. And again, everybody's facility is different. Everybody's going to have to decide what is best for, for themselves and, and their studio environment. It's not going to be a one size fits all. But there's definitely going to be best practices out there and, and best options out there for people to choose from. Yeah, yeah safest. Fair. If you are going to use a UV light for sterilization for anything, what we're planning on doing is having that in a cabinet that when we close it, the light can come on. So that way we're not at all at risk of having our skin exposed for sure. You definitely don't want that shining on you in any way. Right. Just like the ones that we've got in our HVAC systems, like you were talking about, those are inside a sealed box. And yep. all air just gets circulated past that. And a lot of us rent. We don't own our buildings. So we're somewhat limited as far as what we could do, you know, and a lot of that's a very, very expensive and a little bit more cost prohibitive than, you know, installing a new HVAC system for your entire building versus what is best in the individual, you know, work area. I would be very surprised if we didn't see a new generation of air filters come out as a result of this. You're right. Oh, for the sure. The Corona filter. Yeah, yeah there, are, there are facilities that actually uh, some of the uh, pigment manufacturers that they have is uh, air purified every 15 minutes. There is a spray that goes into the air that actually kills any uh, airborne bacteria. And that's something that's actually obviously costs quite a bit of money. So maybe like Guy was saying, the implemented different filtrations that actually kind of do a little bit of that uh, will help a little bit. And the thing is that we always been in this uh, precaution stage and we just tend to forget about it. We're just talking about it now because of the uh, difficulties that we have, but our industry was built from the beginning with lacks of it. And we implemented things a lot that we kind of tend to be comfortable. Now is a way to kind of reawaken that, uh, responsibility for protection and safety and everything else and is stepping up the game and there's nothing wrong with that because it's going to elevate our industry even more so people can see that we're beyond any kind of other businesses uh you know uh, that there are out there that even have more contacts that we do uh, but we just have a more proximity on longevity they would sit with somebody for four five six seven eight hours 
in a day. And that's pretty intense. So the more protection you have is better. And give time for some kind of vaccine or some kind of a help to where when things start de escalating, we start getting relaxed a little bit again, not implementing so many barriers, but still at the same time, always worrying about not bringing that back. Yeah. And well, I think in mind having that appreciation always, regardless of what stage we're in, what you can't see can make you sick or kill you. Yes. It's, it's not a visible threat, you know, and it's having that appreciation all the time. Right. Well, that's the scariest part about this one, too, is people can carry it and not even know it, you know, so it's unlike anything we've all dealt with. And having yeah, protocols yeah. in the shop because you're going to you're going to have an asymptomatic client at some point. Eventually. So how, you know, when that client, let you know, having that protocol, like, you know, if within this period of time you, you develop symptoms and you get sick, you need to let us know because we've had that exposure. And then how mm -hmm. are we going to handle it in house? Are we going to call anyone that was that came in the shop within a certain period or anybody that worked that day needs to quarantine and, you know, maybe alter shifts. So you have certain people that work certain days, but not overlapping in case, you know, there, there's an outbreak. So your whole shop doesn't have to shut down. You can still have people that, you know, mm. I don't know. There's so many considerations, man. Very, very complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to be hopeful of people, good intentions, but we can't rely on that because people can lie about it. Uh, even though we're asking questions and doing that, we always have to be extra careful. Well, people have a weird, uh, like you're saying, uh, they, they lie about it. People have this weird thing of hiding and downplaying illness and denying it, even to themselves, yeah, right? Now, this it. is, right, they would just it's like ignore it and it'll go away. And so we've got that up against us as well. Yeah. But, you know, we are... We are capable of dealing with this. We've dealt with, uh, you know, I mean, like, uh, if we hadn't been on top of our game decades ago, hepatitis could have ended our industry. But that's not what happened. We we learned from it. And, uh, you know, after New York went through that unfortunate incident with uh, hepatitis, the rest of the uh, industry kind of uh, tightened up their game. And, and uh, we've always, since that moment, been mm -hmm. sort of at the cutting edge of, small industries that have to practice these kinds of precautions it's been interesting uh because marty holcomb tattoos at my studio and you know he's reminiscing about the days of tattooing through the hiv epidemic you know back in the day yeah. he said tattooing slowed way way down to the point where i think he said one year he had two clients so he just, you know he consistently worked on them you know did right some, right beautiful body suits on but yeah he said back then it was kind of what we're going through now i mean you were allowed to tattoo back then but it was such a scary moment for, for tattooing and people that he had two clients for a whole year. Yeah, so well, it's that, interesting listening to his take on it and what he's gone through way back in the 80s with, with tattooing this. The HIV virus is a terrifying boogeyman, you know, mm -hmm. and it was a lot worse back then. People are surviving it now. But uh, uh, where with COVID, you've got such a variety of different opinions of if it's a is it worthy of concern or not. And uh, that's been one of the reasons why there's been such a, an uneven response to it. But uh, at the end of the day, we need to take universal precautions, just like with every other uh, threat that, uh, you know, health threat that we've had to deal with in tattooing. And as an industry, we can do this. We can do a great job of it. We can be leaders in the world. Um, exactly. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. Chris Lachance, Jesse Nessie. Derb Morrison, Litos, uh, thank you all for uh, this great discussion. I'm Guy Aitchison. Welcome to uh, Hyperspace Studios and our, our uh, continuing uh, series of uh, quarantine broadcasts. This is number five, and we will be announcing number six sometime soon. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. It's great talking to everybody. Thank you. Thanks for putting it together. Thank you all.